Uh, welcome back, 633. Uh, welcome back to the Real Investment Show. I'm your host, Lance Roberts. Michael Leibwitz, CFA, joining me this morning to talk a little bit about, uh, well, the ISM report, the uh, ADP report yesterday, of course. Uh, that we saw those numbers. Um, but a bit of debate about, you know, the Fed and, and of course, they've been cut. They've cut rates twice this year so far. And, you know, supposedly just under this idea, it's a mid-cycle adjustment, um, which, by the way, if it is just a mid-cycle adjustment, that means they're expecting a 20-year economic expansion if we're mid-cycle. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, uh, don't know if we're going to quite That's get there. That's another way to look at yeah, it. Yeah, exactly. But I don't know if we're quite going to get there. But uh, so Mike's got a new article out. Uh, him and, and Jack Scott have an article out t- today talking about QE by any other name. Um, so let's just uh, kind of a quick synopsis here of, of kind of what's going on. You know, the ADP report was a little bit disappointing yesterday. Um, may see a little bit more weakness. And we've actually been seeing weakness in a lot of the employment data. It's been kind of a slow deterioration in the the rate of growth in employment. Um, what are you seeing here? Yeah, it, that's exactly right. It's a slow deterioration. And we haven't really seen it in the monthly jobs report from the BLS, which we will get tomorrow. But we've seen it in some of the surveys and other indicators. The ISM survey had was pretty bad. It was a 10 year low in the employment subcomponent. Uh, and we've seen it in other areas as well, but jobless claims and again, the BLS number are just not showing anything yet. So we're waiting and uh, we expect that over the coming month or two, and it takes a while to hit these numbers that we will see some deterioration in the jobs reports. And then the question is, how does that spill over into the behavior of the consumer? Mm-hmm. And that's the million dollar question because the consumer is 70 percent of GDP growth. Right. Well, again, if they start losing their job, then that becomes problematic. Right. 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 So we've been talking, you know, for a few months now. We know manufacturing has been getting hit. That was confirmed in the ISM report earlier this week. But we have discussed servicing and employment, the service sector and employment as being two parts of the economy that have been doing well. Today, we'll get the ISM uh, services index, Mm -hmm. and we'll look to see how that's doing, if it can stay above 50, which is kind of denotes whether it's in contraction or expansion. We do know, though, that services in Europe, the ISM reports came up for Europe, and it dropped sharply from 51.9 to 50.1. So they're on the cusp of a uh, contraction in the services industry, right. which pretty much means Europe is in recession. Uh, Germany, France, uh, Spain all got hit. Italy was up a little. Yeah. Well, I mean, we were, we were ta- yeah, we were talking about this just for the break is that you go from, you know, 55 to 54 to 52, 51, and then you get to 49.9 and all of a sudden we're in contraction. Uh, you know, right. we've been contracting for months now and, you know, we're not, maybe, maybe not have not passed the demarcation point of being a contraction, but a, a slowing rate of growth is also contraction. That's right. That's right. So, you know, I think where we're really getting at is whether or not we go into recession is kind of hanging on to the consumer Mm -hmm. and how will they react? So so there's a new new variable, right, with the market declining the last few days. If this continues, it's another headline market down X, Y, Z, because this economic data point was weak. And that slowly but surely will weigh on consumption. Maybe you don't go out to dinner. Maybe you don't go to a movie. You just little spending decisions can have a big effect. Right. And that's what we haven't seen yet. But we're keeping a close eye on, especially given that some of these employment surveys have dropped sharply in the last couple of weeks. Well, you know, it's interesting, too. And I, was, I talked about this early on in the in the show today is that you've got to be a little bit careful with the employment data that's coming out. You know, the headline reports that you're going to get from media is going to be employment was up, you know, 200,000 jobs or whatever it is. Um, you've got to be careful with that because we're right in the middle of hiring people for census, uh, the census, the, the three year uh, census collection. So, you know, we're going to see a, a sharp spike in government job hiring, which shows up in the employment reports. But those are temporary jobs that go away after the census is completed. Right. And the BLS sometimes is good about telling us how many jobs that included. Mm-hmm. Sometimes they're not as good. But to me, the biggest fear are these revisions. They revised the ADP. ADP puts out a survey the Wednesday before the Friday report, employment report. Mm -hmm. And they revised last month down by 48,000 jobs. That's the difference between a really good number and a bad number. Right. So a month ago when we were sitting here talking about ADP, we said that's not so bad. That was a good number. 
Well, now, a month later, we know it wasn't such a good number. <laughs> You've got to be careful with this employment data in particular because, first of all, employment data is very lagging. Uh, corporations hang on to employees as long as they can, um, you know, kind of hoping the economy is going to come back. They, they're, you know, employees are hard to find, they're hard to train, they're expensive to train, so you don't want to get rid of them you know, by mistake, right? And, and thinking that a slowdown is something worse than, than it actually is. So employers tend to hang on to employees for too long. They tend to hire too late. So employment's a very big lagging indicator with, with the economy as a whole. But, you know, it's also very, very much guesswork. I mean, you know, the BLS takes one day out of the month, they call 30,000 households, they say, are you working? Are you not working? And then they make an assumption for 330 million people across America on this very small household survey which gets has has revisions to it over the next three months and then we revise it again the next year and then revise it again three years later so you know this this data is very fluid and it's not very accurate up front right it has a plus or minus of a couple few hundred thousand jobs and the market's going to nitpick about Twenty, thirty thousand jobs. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, the right. margin of error is a lot bigger. Margin than of error, right? <laughs> yeah. Right. It's it, it's crazy. And and, and you've looked on uh, adjusted, unseasonally adjusted numbers. I mean, those are crazy. How much they go up and down. Yeah, exactly. So you know, they're trying to put a fine. It's like inflation. They they try to tell you exactly what inflation in is, but you just can't. It's such a huge population of workers that it's it's impossible to just say oh it was 158,000 yeah. that, that's crazy <laughs> it is and, and and unfortunately though you know the markets hang on to this you know every word of it. the media hangs on to every word of this uh, you know of course uh, it's you know whatever the and, and what's interesting is is that whatever the job report is it's either the president's fault or it's his success one or the other and and right. the president doesn't create jobs it's corporations that create jobs and it's the environment that those jobs are created in that's important and and it all gets lost in the headlines, but you know this is this is what people do for a living. I mean, this is their livelihood. This is where they get their incomes from, and it has everything to do with you know really kind of the the curve of the economy longer term. And and, and we really kind of do a lot of disservice for both investors and just and just everyday you know people that are reading headlines. Um, by really kind of reporting a lot of the stuff the way that we report it. Right. And no one's looking at longer term trends. Like we've been talking about employment showing signs, right? Mm -hmm. The big labor reports are not showing signs, but we're seeing it. We're seeing it in so many different places. And it's just a matter of time before we see an uptick. So as an investor, what's really hard is you have to realize that the market will go up, will go down based on these numbers. But there are kind of flashes in a pan. It'll last a day or two, but it's these longer term trends that you need to follow. And they will ultimately have a much bigger effect on the markets. The Federal Reserve's cut rates twice this year um, so far. And you know, there's a lot of pressure from the White House for the Fed to cut rates more. Um, lots of talk about you know QE. And of course, this is where the Fed is into the markets, supplying liquidity. There's been, you know, we had a conversation, you know, uh, last week about this whole uh, repo situation that's been kind of hitting headlines. Most people really don't understand what, what happens between the banks and the Fed and, you know, if it's any real risk at all. But there's been a lot of activity that's occurring. And the Fed seems to be back into the game of supplying liquidity into the markets. There's two ways to think about that, Lance. They were in this game prior to 2008, mm -hmm. and they were in it daily. In 2008, what they did was they made it permanent, or at least permanent for 10 years. Now we're back at the end of the 10 years, and the question is, will they make it permanent again, which is QE, or will they continue to do these daily, two-week type liquidity injections? Mm -hmm. And now that's the topic of today's article on real investment advice. And it's starting to seem more and more like we are going to get a QE-like liquidity injection into the market. And that's something more permanent. Right, right, because they're buying, they're buying five, 10-year, even longer bonds. And when you do that, they don't mature for five or 10 years. So mm -hmm. that liquidity from when, you per from when the Fed purchases the bond stays in the markets. Well, until maturity, which can be, you know, 5, 10, or even more years. Yeah. Let's go! And welcome back to this morning. I'm your host, Lance Roberts. Realinvestmentadvice.com is the website. Uh, futures are are pointing up, but here's the interesting thing. They're pointing up, but we're actually going to open down this morning. It has a function to do with fair value. 
But um, we're also getting into earnings season. And uh, Pepsi just announced earnings this morning, beating uh, beating their estimates. That stock will be up today. Uh, Con um, Constellation Brands also beat their estimates this morning. So they'll be up today. Mike, back to our conversation here just for the break. Um, we were talking about QE and, of course, the Fed intervening. And the question is now, are they moving back towards doing a, a more permanent QE-type program? And if they are, what kind of size are they talking about? And where does that put us in relation to you know past rounds of quantitative easing that they've done? So what's interesting is, as I said earlier, is the Fed always did this. They would inject liquidity. Sometimes they would do overnight, sometimes one week, two week short liquidity injections, but they would also do what were called coupon passes where they would buy five, 10 year, 30 year bonds. And those were QE, even though they didn't really call it QE back then. And it wasn't that big. They were doing something on the order of 25, 30, 35 billion a year. QE was doing in the hundreds of billions. And they did a total of what, 3.6 trillion over three different uh, periods, but over about three years. So you're talking over a trillion a year was QE versus 30 billion a mm -hmm. year, 25 billion. So QE is vastly different than what they were doing. So there have been numerous articles. I think the most important was from two ex-Fed officials. One is Brian Sack and the other was uh, Joseph Gagnon. And they basically argued the Fed needs to do a permanent liquidity injection, but they never called it really QE which is interesting. So the question is, is it QE or is it what they were doing before the financial crisis? So I'll leave that up to you, the listener. They're talking about doing $250 billion over a period of six months, certainly more than what they did prior to the crisis, which again was about $30 billion a year. Mm -hmm. QE1 was $265 billion over six months. So uh, you know, if it looks like a duck, walks like a duck, quacks like a duck, <laughs> it must be a duck. And I'll leave it. I'll <laughs> leave it to the listener to figure out what it is. But here, but here's okay. But here's the interesting point I think about this as well. Um, in order for QE to have effect, you have to have uh, an environment that is conducive for QE to operate. Um, if we go back and look at QE1 as an example, right, $250 billion, they inject that in the, into the markets. We had a nice economic pickup. We had a big kind of uh, pickup in, in market prices as well. But the environment then was very different than it is today. Interest rates were higher on the 10-year treasury and beginning to fall. Um, we had, uh, you know, very kind of blown out uh, demand in terms of consumption. The consumer had been completely wiped out during the financial crisis. Market sentiment was extremely negative. Valuations were substantially cheaper than they are today. Um, you know, so if you take a look at that environment and you kind of think, and we kind of talked a little bit about this yesterday, made this illusion of, you know, you kind of look at that environment and you have, you know, a fire that's burned out, right? You've got the smoldering embers of, of the fires there, and then you go throw gas on it. All of a sudden, you're going to get a big, big flame out of it. Um, well, today, we've got just the opposite. You know, we've got, you know, very high confidence in the markets, got a very high consumer confidence, employment. Oh, by the way, unemployment back in 2009 was, you know, double digits versus, you know, record lows today. Um, you know, we've, but we've got, you know, record low unemployment, record low jobless claims. I mean, everything really, honestly, is about as good as it can get. And and so you, you go back to our analogy and you have a, a raging fire and you're going to throw gas on it. It may burn a little bit brighter, but it's not going to burn any hotter. So the effectiveness of $250 billion may be disappointing for market participants. And quite honestly, it could be the opposite of what what QE1 did, what QE2 and what QE3 mm -hmm. did. It, it's it, Again, it's an extremely different uh, environment. And we can't just assume that what happened in the past is going to happen in the future. Right. I mean, well, you know, the initial effect is going to be, you know, obviously people are going to run out and buy stuff because, you know, in the markets anyway, just because they're going to think that it's going to be the same as before. The problem that we're having is because there is too much debt and they are not printing enough money to keep up with the debt. So you have a couple options. You can you can do more QE, basically providing the banks with reserves, and that allows them to lend money, or you can deleverage. And it's funny that we know we have a debt problem in this country at every level, at the consumer, the corporate, and the government level, yet the answer is to feed it. 
to feed the debt problem? The answer is never. Maybe we need to get rid of some debt. And that's... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's the, getting, that's getting rid no of debt. I'm not. Sure, yeah, getting rid of debt. I'm not sure is an answer for the government. <laughs> well, it's, I don't think it's an answer for anyone, for any sector, right. right? Because if the consumer gets rid of debt, that means GDP is going lower. Well, and, and look, and that's you know, this is a, a huge issue. I think you know, really, that we've talked about to you know many different fronts is that you know the debt and the deficit. We're running a you know a trillion dollar deficit now in the middle of an economic expansion. And we've got a government that's basically saying, you know what, um, let's just spend more money. Right. And we have corporations that have more debt on their books as a percentage of GDP mm -hmm. than they've ever had. Using it very inefficiently to buy back stock. They're not investing in the future. They're not investing in their employees. They're trying to cut employees whenever they can. <laughs> or not so, hire them. <laughs> right. So, I, you know, I think the way to think about this, instead of getting caught up in the technical weeds, is... It's a symptom of a much bigger problem. And once again, even though they may have forestalled that problem for 10 years, in, right after the mm -hmm. during and after the financial crisis, it's coming back again. Well, and, and look, we're seeing the same thing um, in Europe. Um, of course, you know, the ECB has recent lowered interest rates. They're going back to doing QE. They're doing everything they can. And, it, you know, it's interesting because we look around the world, we've got, you know, a tremendous amount of debt that's now running at negative interest rates. We've got a, a situation where despite all of this bailouts and, and liquidity support and flows and everything else is happening, you know, economic growth is weakening, you know, globally. Uh, Japan is trying to really try to figure out now how to do something, anything to try to get rates up off of zero and they simply can't do it. And despite all the the ideas, and yes, the stock markets have performed well, but the stock markets are not really a, a direct correlation to what's happening economically. And of course, this is why we have all these conversations about the wealth gap and wealth inequality and all this other stuff. You know, despite all of the, the headline news about QE being a good thing, it really hasn't been. And it's destroyed banking really kind of all over the world. Right. It buys you time. It's a Band-Aid. But Japan, who is far ahead of us, is quickly finding out that negative rates are bad, that QE isn't doing what it was supposed to do, that they've essentially destroyed their banking system. And I think that's really coming up to hit them hard right now. Mm -hmm. And like I said, they're ahead of us, but they're also smaller. They're, they're, they're unique in their own ways. Right. But this is what's coming for Europe and eventually for the U.S. if we continue down this path of feeding the debt bubble, yeah. which is what what they're doing now with this liquidity and not focusing on the future. Yeah, I'll tell you, in, in uh, terms of economic indicators to pay attention to, is one is auto sales. Um, auto sales are really taking a sharp downturn, and that's uh, very much a leading indicator of the economy because when people can't afford to buy a car – even stretching out loans now for eight years just to try to get a payment they can afford, that really tells you a lot about what's happening. They are now stretching loans out to eight years. And what that does is it makes cars more affordable on a monthly payment basis. Mm -hmm. That just tells you how indebted the consumer is that the answer, instead of not buying a car, buying a used car, buying a cheaper car, is to somehow figure out a way to borrow money to make it affordable. There's a huge implied problem that's going to come from this down the road because the average person trades in their car every three to four years. Um, so all of a sudden, if I've got a note that's eight years in duration, that means I have a tremendous amount of negative equity in that car uh, for a very long period of time. And by the time I go to trade in that car, which is now eight years old or older, I've lost any residual value mostly in that car. So there's going to be a tremendous number of people that may be able to do one trade in, but eventually that negative equity component that gets rolled into the next cars is going to become so great they can no longer trade in a car. And what happens when people start getting laid off and yep. they can't make those payments and they basically someone else is going to take the hit on yep. that negative equity? Yeah. And that would be the automakers and the automaker finance companies. And the banks. <laughs> and the <right>. banks. <laughs> All right, Mike, thanks a lot. Uh, yep. Mike Leibowitz joining us today. Uh, his article on the website, uh, QE by any other name, is on the website now, realinvestmentadvice.com. Get daily investment news you can use. Sign up for the Real Investment Report now at realinvestmentadvice.com.